This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Lessons Learned. And today we are talking with Janet Galen, and I'm putting her on the opposite side of the microphone, so to speak, because typically she's out there asking all the questions, and today we're going to ask her a lot of questions. Um, But it's for all of us to get to know each other and to learn from those lessons that we were taught and maybe have no idea why we were being taught them. So my first question to you, Janet, is number one, did you have a good holiday? Yes. Good, good. Because, you know, COVID has made it difficult for a lot of people over the holiday. It was good in that new way that things are good. You know, you do your best alone and you get you get to really alone count your blessings and that's that's good that and i totally agree with you uh i enjoyed spending the majority of the of the day um just curled up on my couch um not worrying about uh having to do a recording reading my email anything else and uh so that was nice we had our first like my daughters got in touch and said how about we have a gifts free holiday this year no gifts I love and, it. Great. And it was, it was, you know, I get my daughter's gifts and I get sweaters and coats and, and I think I'm, and they always have to be returned. They're not quite the right size. And, and so everybody's got more errands to do. This was so freeing for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know what? There's a song that I've been listening to that a good friend of mine wrote and it's called, um, I give you enough. Oh, good. And you know what? that's that's how we spent the holiday basically telling each other you know you just sitting across the room from me is is enough knowing that you're healthy that's enough because you're right you know somebody may give us a sweater they may give us a box of candy and those are wonderful exchanges but you know what we can go out and buy a box of candy if we really want candy and for me, a box of candy is kind of iffy because it's gone in 12 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> totally get it. <laughs> totally get it. So anyways, here we are, uh, the end of 2020. And um, I really wanted our listeners to get a feel of, you know, all the great things that happen in our lives um, and even some of the not so great things. So my next question to you is, Um, Has there been anybody in particular in your life, in the past or present, that has taught you a lesson that you think is really important to share? Well, I have a few particulars, my mother and my father, and they are, they were all very well spoken, good lessons. I'll tell you about them if you want. Okay. And then, and then. My daughters, my granddaughter, and one friend in particular who has been invaluable with less. So I've got many people. So when you're learning these lessons, do you realize that you're being taught something at the time? Oh, yeah. Yes. Interesting. And I, you know, I, I like things by example. Those are always wonderful. But I do better with things by example with a little explanation as well. I love, I like direct, um, I like direction. Interesting. My, my, my mother told me when I was about six, and that's a pretty little girl. That's pretty young. Yeah. And she told me, and I do not know why she told me this, but she did. She said, you know, now that you're going to be in school a lot, you may have friends that I don't care much for. But if you have a friend and you know why you like that friend, even if I don't, ignore me. Interesting. And that comes from a totally different time in life when a lot of our parents were very specific who our friends should or shouldn't be. Yeah, she had a couple of those sneak in, but but in general, it was, it was a good lesson. Absolutely, absolutely. So did you have a special friend that maybe mom did not really approve <laughs> of? I don't know, because I, only one in high school. And she was she was kind of, You know, she looked like kind of one of the loose girls. I I don't know that she was or wasn't. And she lived not too far from me. And she came over one day, knocked on the door. My mother opened the door. I was there and she threw her arms around me. And, and, you know, we chatted for a few minutes. And my mother said, I don't think you should be hanging around with her. 
Hmm. But she never told you why. Oh, I knew why. You knew why. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I had a feeling you did, but I just wonder. <laughs> yeah. You know, my, my mother said, I mean, I guess I can say it. I'm not saying the name that she seems cheap. Got it. Okay. And that was the only time she ever did that. I thought that was kind of harsh, but, you know. Well, I had, I had one friend um, when I was, I had to been between the ages 11 and 13. Um, and she used to walk with me when I went to Hebrew school. So I'd come home from school, change my clothes to go to Hebrew school. And she lived down the street and she always went with me. And across from Hebrew school, there was a phenomenal bakery. Okay. <laughs> and you know, she always convinced me that we had to stop at the bakery and we each had to buy a treat and share it. Um, and I didn't get allowance, you know, and so I really didn't have any money unless I asked my mother for some. And then I had to have a good reason to ask her for some. But I knew where my mother kept change. Ah. And I would sneak in there and take out some change so that we could go to the bakery. And one day my mother asked me, she said, are you taking change? And I go, yeah. Oh, good for you. Yeah, well, I knew I was being caught. It was so obvious the way she asked it. And she said, and what's it for? And when I told her, she said, I don't want you walking to Hebrew school with her ever again. And I said, why? And she said, I don't think you know this but she steals money. And I had heard that from our friends, oh, but I did, you know, right. my friends would never steal, you know, but as soon as my mother said that, my mother said to me, and I think you're sort of taking after her because you've been taking money out of my jar. And from that point on, it was like, I never walked with her again. I don't think we ever even discussed it. You know, it just, yes, just went a different route and, didn't run into her. She never asked me and never took money from my mother ever again. She so had a good point, yes. Lessons learned there. So I got another very good sure. lesson. Good. From my mother by her refusal to take part in something that was a an absolutely I don't mean, you know non-negotiable uh, tradition and that is signing report cards. I would bring my report cards home from grammar school. And the first, I went to a private school till the third grade, but then we got actual report cards. I brought my report card home and I said to my mother, you have to sign my report card. And she said, I'm not signing that. I'm not signing your report card. That's ridiculous. And I said, but you have to sign it. She said, I don't have to sign it. It doesn't matter what grades you get. It's not important. I'm not signing it. So I forged her, you know, I was an eight year old, pretty good forger, I thought. I signed her name and turned it in. I found a couple of those report cards a few years ago when I was cleaning stuff out. I should have been arrested. I thought it was, I mean, it wasn't bad for an eight-year-old, but it was clearly <laughs> a talented eight-year-old forger. And she just would have no part of it. So the school never called her to verify it was her signature, obviously. No. And I got all A's. I mean, it was grammar yeah. school, you know, so she, it didn't matter. I suppose if I had gotten D's and F's, maybe she would have felt, maybe not. She had a definite rebellious streak in her, which was just delightful. Well, and it sounds, you know, I like the fact that she said she didn't care what the grades were that you were getting because she could tell what you were learning. Okay. She also said, she also said very clearly, it's not important what grades you get. And the lesson there was kind of, it's not important what other people think of you. Right. Although she, although she had areas, I'll tell you that you had to be proper and you probably are right alongside me with some of these. There were certain colors you couldn't wear together. Right. You could not wear red and pink. Yes. I, I loved red and pink. I did it. And if you couldn't wear, you couldn't wear, if you had, I tended towards red, you know, you couldn't wear purple if you had red hair purple and all these colors. So one day I was in high school and I, and I love blue and green together. That was a big taboo against blue and green. They don't go together. I don't know who, but do you remember that? Yeah, I do. I, I don't know who dreams these things up. And 
so I came downstairs with this um, khaki green straight skirt that I loved and a powder blue shirt. Oh, I like that. Well, my mother didn't like that. Mm. And she said, oh, you have, go, go upstairs and change. You can't, you can't wear those two colors. Go change. You can't go out of the house looking like this. And I said, but I really, I like these colors. They're beautiful together. A friend of hers was over, Janet Brandt, God bless her. And she was watching my mother tell me this. And my mother was quite insistent that you couldn't do blue and green together. My mother's friend, who was an actress in a very free spirit, so was my mother in most ways, but anyway, looked at my mother and said, Ruthie, blue and green, the sky meets the grass. It's good enough for God. Why can't she do it? I love it. And I never heard another word from my mother about that sort of thing. She learned, you know, she was good at learning. Well, and you know, I think sometimes when we learn in a manner like that, okay, um, it's easier to either accept it or to say, you know, I'm still going to do what I want to do because there's no really right or wrong, except well, there was in those days. Well, it's, you know, it seemed, I mean, that, that passed for. Exactly. But today you see all colors together. You see all patterns yeah. together. Um, you know, I'll never forget. Um, oh, probably a couple of years before my mother passed away. She had picked up this beautiful, like plaid blazer. Okay. And she had a flowered skirt that had the exact same colors in it. Uh huh. And I went up to Michigan to visit her and I saw her wearing it. And my first reaction was, why would you put that together? Right. And I thought, well, you know, maybe her eyesight isn't so good. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to make a big deal of it. Right. And we went out to lunch and my cousin was there. And my cousin is all excited about my mother's new outfit. Auntie Dorothy, that looks so beautiful together, you know, and the colors and it matches your eyes and everything. And I'm sort of looking at the two of them like, you know, are they playing against me or something? And then I got home and my mother said, you don't like my, my jacket and skirt together. I said, it's not that I don't like it. I'm just unaware that those things go together. And she said, I went to a fashion show here. Where oh. she lived. That was one of the outfits. Now that must've been like in the sixties. No, this was just back like about 10 years ago. Oh, so way late. In the, yeah. I see. Okay. And I, but I, and I said to her, so you went to a fashion show? And she said, yes. And she said, and let me tell you, you can wear plaid and polka dots together and plaid and floral. And I said, you never let me. And she said, poo poo on that. So well, I knew what she was. She never, she never let you because it was so verboten right. in the late, well, I'm older than you, but the 40s and 50s, you couldn't, you, oh, there were so many you couldn't. Absolutely. Yes. So you learn lessons from your mom. So you mentioned your daughters. Okay. What kind of lessons do your daughters and granddaughters teach you? Oh, you know, well, okay. I, I was reminded of this one the other day, only because I was watching people were coming down on Joe Biden rather harshly. You know, I read an article that his olive branch was withering and people are so I was reminded, I want him to have a new slogan. I was reminded when my younger daughter was three, I was cooking and I was chopping mushrooms with a sharp knife, but mushrooms are easy to cut, you know? And she was maybe just over three. And she said, oh, can I do that? I said, sweetheart, you're, you're not quite old enough to do this. And she said, well, I'd like to, I wanna try. I said, when you're older, you can. And she said, well, I want to try it now. And I said, you know what, sweetheart? And she looked at me. She said, give the kid a chance. <gasps> I love it. I gave the kid a chance. She did it better than I was doing it. But I want Joe Biden to be able to just go on TV and say, give the kid a chance. Yes. You yeah, know, it's such, it's such a good wash word. So, and it is interesting, you know, as parents, we think we have to protect our children. And that's what you were doing with your daughter. Right. Um, and oftentimes our, our children 
are watching us so closely. They're learning those lessons that we're not even verbally giving to them. Right. Um, and, you know, it's so interesting, the things that tend to mean something to us as we get older. Um, we were talking before we went on air. I remember my mother always saying to me, you know, nice little girls always sit, you know, with their uh -huh. dress down and their legs crossed. And I did. And I had a friend who mentioned it to me and she said, I never understood it. And I uh -huh. said, well, you know, you, you didn't want anybody to look up your skirt. You should have right. <laughs> pants. And right. she said, but most of her life, she's worn pants. Oh, yes. She said, okay. So what were they going to look up? My cuffs? Right. And he said, right. you're, you're right. She said, but somebody took a picture of her at some event that she was at. And she realized because she didn't pay attention to what mom had told her when she was younger, she sits with her legs sprawled. She's a tiny woman, but she looks fat in a picture the way she sits. Oh, And it was that picture. So her first thought was, my mother told me this, so I wouldn't look fat in a picture. And ah. I said, no, I don't think so. Your mother didn't want anybody looking up your skirt. <laughs> or, or looking your crotch area, even in pants. Right, exactly. Yes. yes. So, you know, there are lots of lessons. And even you and I working together with, with Zoom, we learn from each other. You know, and sometimes we don't even realize that we're learning something new. Um, and it's about openness. Ah, there you go. Oh, I'll tell you something else. And in, in regard to openness, if I may, sure. I have a very close friend in Los Angeles. And for years, you know, I go down there maybe three, four times, four times a year to visit family and friends. It's where I'm from. And I would, you know, have had long hair for, and then I'd get my hair cut short. And my one friend, Babette, would say to me, oh, that haircut, it's taken 10 years off your life. You look 10 years younger, is what she meant to say. Not that you're going to die right, 10 years Right, younger. right. You look 10 years younger. Okay, thanks. I don't know. I wouldn't be down there. I wouldn't see her maybe for another six months. I'd go down there. And my hair was longer. And she'd say, look at you with your hair long. You look 10 years younger. <laughs> well, that's what I, I finally said. You know, you can't have it every which way. Short. I, then I read a really interesting article that said, essentially, it's the willingness to change that's euthifying. And I can believe that. Absolutely. Me too. I mean, I just noticed that your hair was a little bit different and, you know, you look 10 years younger. <laughs> it, you know, it's that willingness not to get stuck with your 1920s eyebrows. Right. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Or, you know, I'll never forget when legging pants first came into, you know, being the thing about what, almost 10 years now. Um, I had a family event to go to and I had put on a little bit of weight and dresses just, I did, I personally did not like how they looked at me. So I had these silk legging pants and a tunic top. Sounds pretty. And, oh, I, I mean, I probably was the most comfortable person all night long, but I remember walking into this event and my cousin who is probably maybe 10 to 15 years younger than me. Um, and she's, I call her very adult and I call myself very unadult. Okay. Um, and she looked at me and she said, I can't believe you're wearing that outfit. And I said, is there something wrong? She said, oh no, I love it on you. Oh, good. But she said, I feel older than you now. And I looked at her and I thought she's very natural. Okay, has never colored her hair. So 10 to 15 years younger than me. She had gray coming in, although she had pitch black hair with gray. It was gorgeous. Um, but she wore longer dresses, even when they weren't necessarily the style. But I looked at her and I said, don't you feel comfortable in what you're wearing? Don't you think you look good? And she goes, yes. I said, that's all that matters. I said, because if I was wearing a dress today, I wouldn't feel comfortable. I said, now, I know I don't look thin. I said, but for me, I'm covering just enough of those spaces and I'm comfortable. And, you know, 
my mother laughed at me when she, you know, we'd talk about it and she'd say, you know, you wore jeans when, you know, women, you know, really weren't wearing jeans, young girls were. And I said, if they fit, why not? If I like them, why not? And but then there's also something to be said for that inner comfort shining out and it gets, it, it looks beautiful. Do you know, I read once, do you know what the word glamour actually means? No. But you, we use it. Somebody's like, yeah, sure. I think it, I think it was a, I could be wrong. Never mind where it came from. It means in its original sense, giving the illusion of having great beauty while actually possessing none. Wow. Isn't that a wow? It is a wow. And when you think about people calling women glamorous, it's never actually about how they look. It's about what's coming out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, uh, and we talk a lot about that um, here at the station. And you talk a lot about that in your podcasting too, because it is about that inner strength, that inner beauty that we all have, but sometimes we just don't give ourselves enough confidence for having it. So my question to you is, where did you get all this confidence from? Genetic. And, and that's, that's kind of understating. My parents were very encouraging. I, I pretty much only had to draw breath to get their approval. I think that's it. Wow. That's it. I mean, that was very, very clear to me. Even though, even though my mother could be like with the blue and green and setting table. I mean, I could set table for Buckingham Palace, thanks to her. But in general, I was really loved for nothing. I think we all should be loved. Yeah. I mean, whatever I was, was just right. fine. Yes. Absolutely. So what lessons are you teaching your granddaughters? I hope all of those. I mean, yeah, I'll tell you my, my, I'm learning more from my granddaughter taught me something several years ago. She's 12 now. She was eight and she had gone on. And I consider myself a fairly rational person, although I do reach panic in certain situations like this one. She had gone to Santa Cruz boardwalk for a birthday party and they had one of those drop rides. So I guess you reach terminal velocity before you get jerked yeah. back. Anyway, and I said, you went on that? And she said, I did, she was eight. She said, I did, but never again. And I said, oh my goodness. I said, were you just screaming? She said, no, I didn't scream. I said, really? She said, no. I looked around, I saw that everyone else was screaming and it didn't seem to help. So I didn't bother. I love it. So, I mean, that's just a lesson in being kind of rational. And, and my father had also taught me very early on to look for a third factor when it came to A causes B. Don't assume that A causes B because somebody tells you it does. Look for C that might be causing both. And this is particularly important. Well, it's always important, but now when you get so many studies thrown at you that such and such causes such and such, oh, don't buy it so fast. Take a, take a closer look. You know, it's interesting that you talk about studies and what people are professing works. Um, I've been having some indigestion issues. I've been run through all the tests. They keep telling me there's nothing wrong. So I'm told by two doctors, there's this great program out there, Karen. I'm sure you've read about it. It's called Noom. You should go on it. So I looked it up and it's, it's not expensive. It's not cheap, but it's not expensive, but you get to eat real food, okay? No special or a diet program that would help. Well, it's it's supposed to be psychological yes. and help you understand. The problem with this thing is that you live for eating and not eating. Oh yes. So I went on it mm -hmm. and I went off of it after a week because I was driving myself crazy. <laughs> but everything I was reading about, because they give you lessons every day that you're supposed to read and go through and evaluate yourself right just on top of eating properly doing your work exercising and i thought to myself you know what i don't need to listen to all these people i know what to do Good. if i don't do it that's on me 
Okay. Oh, okay. So that's a really good, my, uh, another lesson. We never had a scale in our house. My father was a physician. You would think, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess one day I was in like maybe early high school. I wanted to weigh myself or something. And I said, why don't we have a scale? He said, we don't need a scale. I said, but how do you know how much you weigh? He said, it doesn't matter how much you weigh. He said, if you've gained too much weight, you'll know it because your pants won't zip. Right. And so that, that this whole business about we're too heavy. And I read today an article, apparently it was in People Magazine, but I saw it online about a woman who lost 200 pounds. She had slowly gotten herself up to something like 360 pounds. Wow. And she was enormous, but she was, she still, she had a beautiful face, but she was, she lost 200 pounds over two years. And the way she did, and she's gorgeous. I mean, she is just exquisite. So her daughters. And she said, she, the, looking at the task of losing 200 pounds, pretty much un, not doable. Right. She said, so I just focused on losing five pounds. And once I did that, it was just like hit the refresh button. And she, two years. But I mean, that's a lesson in patience. And, and you and know. Diligence. And as I went through this program for the week and driving myself crazy, um, it was yesterday when I came home and I said to my husband after working, oh. I said, I am, I still could get my refund. I said, I'm getting my refund. And he goes, okay, just tell me why. And I said, I know what to do, but I also know when I'm not doing it. I said, so, you know, I want to be happy and happy is not constantly reading. Hey, did you have an extra bite of that? Okay. I agree. Yes. And, and there are still foods that I'm supposed to be eating that don't agree with me. And so it's like, so why am I eating oh. that if it doesn't agree with me? Um, you look so, gorgeous. I mean, well, I appreciate that, but these are the lessons that, we all need to learn, but our body tells us what's right. right and what's wrong. We just have to listen. That's right. That is so right. So listening to your body, listening to other people, seeing what's in there. I have a, had a friend, he's no longer with us. And we were, this is a great lesson that I should, I need to pay more attention to. And it, we were talking about something. We're kind of arguing good naturedly back and forth about something. And I thought it should be this way. And he thought it should, and Every time he made a point, I would come back so fast because I was, I, I was concentrating on what I was going to say next is the truth instead of open heart. He looks at me after about 10 minutes of this. He says, you know what? You're listening with your mouth. <laughs> and we do that. <laughs> yes. we, I mean, and it's not just you. We, we all do that because... <laughs> We all want to be right. We all want to say something that um, is going to impress the other person. Um, I've learned on the weekends when I'm doing IT training that I, I have to know when to shut up, okay? Because when you ask me a certain question, I have to make sure that I understand what you're asking me so I can show you what it is that you want, not what I think is important. Yes. And I've had clients on the weekend say to me, I learned from you. And I'll look at them. Well, I appreciate that. And they'll say, no, because you're telling me what it is I need to know. And I said, well, that's my job. Okay. I could tell you 10 other things, but if you're not interested, you're not going to retain it. And then you may not even retain what you really wanted to. Yeah. And so that's something that we all have to learn to do is to listen with our ears and know when to speak and when not to speak. There's also something about, this is again from my father. I used to love being corrected. I used to love it. If I would pronounce something wrong or I would, you know, as a little girl and, and you know, till later on also. Or if I said something that was a fact that was just, I got wrong. And he, he, he always would start out by saying, you know, sweetheart, that's really pronounced. There was never a, you're wrong. There was never an indication of being wrong. There was an indication of, 
I'm going to give you some a, a good armaments, you know, like I'm going to give you something valuable that's going to make your life better by telling you what what the real reality is. And he could have done it differently and just have said, no. That's how it's pronounced. That, yeah, right. exactly. Right. And that's how I was brought up, the opposite exactly. from you. Yeah. You know, I if I said something, um, even if my mother was wrong and telling me that I was wrong, um, <laughs> you, you, you just had to believe her, okay? Yes. Um, and then years later, as I became an adult, every once in a while, I would remind her, I remember when you told me such and such. And she'll look, no, I never told you that. Okay, well, I'm not sure then where I heard it, mother. But um, so listening, evaluating, and also making choices for ourselves. That's what the lessons are that we're learning. But, but also you have to learn the lesson that you can make those choices for yourself. I mean, that has to underlie it, right? Absolutely. So when you started your podcast and you talk about love letters, mm -hmm. love letters, you know, they're so important. And a love letter isn't necessarily professing your undying um, heart to somebody. A love letter can be just about anything. Right. Um, what did you want others to get out of that? What was the lesson that you were hoping to teach other people? Oh, so many levels of this, but I think my, my realization was, and some other time I'll tell you how this came about really, a friend of mine asked me to write her obituary and I refused. She's not sick. She just likes a well-written obituary. Okay. Anyway, we went back and forth and I finally thought, why not? And I refused, refused, refused. And I finally thought, why not write it and send it to her as a love letter? Why should you have to wait till you're six feet under to know what people thought about you? Anyway, I did it. And the, the results were just stunning. She, she called me finally three weeks later. And this little voice said, I read what you wrote and it was just beautiful, but I didn't recognize myself in it. She's gorgeous and talented and just perfection walking the earth. And I didn't recognize myself in it. And I said, what? You know how good I am at this. That is to say, seeing what's in other people. And she said, I just didn't. And then I thought, you know, double the gift. First of all, you should, you should see yourself. You should get to know how people feel about you while you're still living on earth. Absolutely. And you should also see yourself most realistically. And that is through the eyes of someone who loves you. And so, you know, I, I made this presentation. Anyway, one thing grew to the other. But what I really am aware of is that no matter what circumstance, what happens in your life, what you go through, whether it's something positive or adorably funny or awful and difficult, there are the seeds of every experience. There are the seeds of a love letter to someone in it. I mean, I've, I've had people talk about, oh, you know, just abusive, being abused and, you know, hard to, hard to let your heart take this in. And they always end up wanting to write a love letter of forgiveness or understanding or to heal. It's just gorgeous. And if it seems like there's no one to write a love letter to, I'd like everybody to know this, you can write one to yourself just patting yourself on the back for having gotten through something difficult, having survived something difficult, and then mail it to yourself. Get it in the mail because you will see that the you who wrote that letter and the you who reads that letter are two different people. And that is amazing to me. It's a complicated area, but yeah, that's kind of... Well, but it is important that we find it in ourselves, okay? Yeah. And I agree, um, you know, if I were to ask somebody to write my obituary, um, I would want to see it before I'm six yeah. feet under because I'll never know what was said. Um, and if there is something negative about me and I still have a choice. That's right. Good for changes, you. You, yes. Know? Yes. Uh, you know, I'll never forget uh, my mother in the last couple of weeks of her life. Um, 
we shared a lot and she was going in and out of dementia, but when she was present, she was really present. And one day I said to her, you know, I really, really love you. I said, but I love you because you've been outspoken. You've taken me to task. Um, you've made me the strong woman that I am today. And I didn't realize that until we were having these conversations. And I remember her lying there going, well, of course, that's what I was doing, honey. I've always loved you. But sometimes I had to be mean to tell you. And I thought about it. And it's like, she was right. Because I well, would that, not, that, I that may, heard it. That may have been the route that she understood best. Right. As having a result. Exactly. So, you know, telling that person how important they are to you. Um, and I love the fact that you use an actual pen to write where most of us are still typing. Well, okay. So you know how often people say, I wish I had a magic wand. I've said it. We, I always say you have one. It's this thing that you can write letters with and the results are just stunning all the time. And, you know, when you think about it, if you have a, I mean, I do this, you have a positive thing you feel about somebody, just jot it down and mail it because gratitude or positive feelings about someone taken to the grave serves no one. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it does a world of good if you send it on out there. Well, and we're leaving lessons behind for others right. as well. Right. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today. This thank was you for asking me. It's so much fun to talk to you. Absolutely. I, I miss seeing you on a weekly basis. But you. I, I have been, you know, listening to your your love letters live. And you, uh, it's it's wonderful the people that you bring on and the stories they share. Um, and that's what life is all about, sharing. Yes. And, there's and bolstering each other up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially now. I mean, this right. has been a tough year. Yes. And for people, older people who are in care facilities, my brother's in a dementia facility and he can't have any, they can't have visitors. They've got to feel abandoned. Absolutely. Nobody's coming to see them. They, I send him, you know, notes. I'll just send postcards and notes. Just say, I love you. I'm thinking of you. And he'll read those again and again. And yeah. Well, they never change, but but the feelings are always there. And that's yeah. what's important. Well, I want to wish you a happy 2021. Me to you. Be safe. And uh, hopefully, you know, COVID will be something of the past. Uh, yes. And we'll have this great reunion of wonderful podcasters somewhere. And we can all get to meet in person. I love it. Wonderful. I would love to see you in person. It's funny how you can become like good friends and feel such affection for somebody that you've never seen in the flesh, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. So send you a hug. I love you too. Have a great day. Thank you, Bye -bye. dear. Bye. Bye.